Hello, assassins and anti-heroes. My name is TV Sky. And uh, a little bit of annoying housekeeping before we can get into the video today. Patreon.com is the site where I have a campaign. People, a lot of people support me. And just on general principle, I'd like to say I'm very, very grateful for that support. Trouble is, here in August, as Patreon was processing the payments for a heck of a lot of creators, they tried to make some kind of change to their payment system, at least that's as far as I can gather from talking to people, and that caused a hell of a lot of payments to get either declined or downright marked as fraud because the bank detected that some kind of change was happening or something wasn't quite right, and then they just freaked out, marked the whole thing as fraud, and refused to process the payment. The upshot of that is that a lot of creators have lost a hell of a lot of money this month. Uh, some people I've talked to have lost as much as 50 or 60% of all of their pledges have just not gone through this month, which is a massive hit to a lot of people. Uh, it seems to be mostly focused around the United States. People from the United States uh, pledging and people from the United States making stuff have been hit very much the hardest. As for me, I've lost about 20% of my income this month, which is not, it's not great. I, I'm, I'm gonna be okay. Barely, but it's I'm gonna be fine, but it's annoying. So you should head on over if you support me if you support anyone on Patreon You should head on over to the website check your payment settings Make sure that you haven't been declined or unsubscribed from everything for no good reason Make sure your payment went through and if your payment didn't go through You might need to contact your bank and tell them that no no this this is not this is not some kind of fraud It's okay. You can you can let the money uh, go through as normal Unless, of course, you wanted to have the payment declined, in which case you don't need to worry about what I just said here. Anyway, thank you all very much. Those of you who support the Patreon, thank you very much. Uh, if you support anyone on the website, please go and check your payment settings. Make sure it's it's all in order. Make sure you didn't get double charged for something. And by the way, if anyone who supports me gets got double charged this month, get in touch with me. And I should be able to issue you a refund uh, from Patreon so you, we can get that sorted out. So with that bit of nonsense out of the way, let's talk about Akali, because she's finally getting released to the live servers, which means that we have all of her lore finally available for us to peruse, so we can ask the long-awaited question, what's the deal with Akali? Because there are actually a bunch of interesting things going on with her, but we're not going to be talking that heavily about the specifics of her character design because we have already done that we did that in the video when we compared her new character design to the old character design and there's going to be a link to that done in the description so what we're going to be talking about in this specific video rather is her lore her story what is what's the concept about what what kind of character is she does that fit with her character design like does that work with it is it a good story is it an interesting way to kind of execute things and hide how does it tie in to the wider ionian lore but we're also going to be talking about something that's kind of a first for League of Legends, which is lore progression through a rework. So what this means is that old Akali is still canon. She still exists within the lore of League of Legends. Unlike a lot of the other re uh, re reworks, the old Akali has not been erased from the canon of League of Legends. She still exists. What we have here in the reworked Akali is essentially the designers and the writers going, okay, so if we take Akali and then shift her timeline forward like five years, what kind of person comes out in the end? And the result is the Akali that you see on screen right now. It's an attempt to move her story forward, which is an interesting idea. It's something Riot has flirted with before when Tarek got his update, changing him from the Gem Knight into the Targonian aspect of protection or whatever the hell he is, he is now the aspect of the stars, I think. They kind of sort of slightly implied that this was supposed to be a lore progression for him, like that the old Gem Knight Tarek wasn't completely not canon. He was just sort of almost not canon, but then he evolved into the new version of Tarek. Now that was not... Like, because the old Tarek lore was that he was a gem magic guy from an alternate dimension who got summoned onto Rune Terra and then decided to stick around and use his gem magic for stuff. That, all of that is gone. Like, that's all retconned away. He was never the gem knight in the new version of his lore. He was a aspiring soldier from Damasi who used a hammer and a shield, but nonetheless, he was a, he was a Damasian soldier who became a Damasian commander. He fucked up. He goes up on Targon to atone for his, for his crimes and gets selected to be the aspect of the stars by some kind of magic spirit on Targon. So that was not quite the same thing. This is the first time, to my knowledge at least, that Riot have actually genuinely attempted to progress the lore of a character through a rework. Now, it's probably not something they're going to be doing a whole lot of, I imagine, because, like, that would be... 
it, it would be very weird if you only got updates on a character's story when they were so outdated and bad that Riot have to, had to give them a full update. That that would not be a great model for doing it, but for the purposes of Akali, it's kind of an interesting experiment. So, what is her new lore nowadays? Well, Akali was the Fist of Shadows, uh, the Fist of Shadow for the Kinku Order. Now, the Kinku Order, who are they? Well... Brace yourselves for a long story. On, in Ionia, there is an order of ninjas called the Kinku who are responsible for maintaining the balance between the material world and, and uh, the spiritual world. And they have to do that by any means necessary, and sometimes that involves murdering people. This is the role of the Fist of Shadow, who is when you have to kill someone in order to maintain the balance, the Fist of Shadow is the one you call. The previous Fist of Shadow was Akali's mother, Mayim, um, who... As a fun little side fact, when Akali's lore update was first announced, it was sort of implied by someone on the boards, one a rioter, I think, that Akali had two mothers, like, that her mothers were gay. But they immediately walked that back by saying, no, 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 that's not, that's not true. Um, <clears throat> but I would like to say that it says here in the lore that Akali... Daughter of Mayim Jomenteti, the Narano Fist of Shadow of Mayim, and her partner Tano raised their daughter within the Kinku Order under the watchful leadership of Great Master Kusho, the Eye of Twilight. Akali's other parents' gender is never specified. They die, and so we don't really get to know anything about them. But so I, th I think I think it might have been intended at some point that Akali was to have two mothers in a in a same sex relationship, but then Riot just decided not to make that explicit for whatever reason. Anyway, that's completely besides the point. Akali was the Fist of Shadow, trained to be an assassin in the Kinku Order to restore balance when needed by killing those who needed to be destroyed. And then uh, Sed showed up. So Sed, as you may know, was a former acolyte of the Kinku Order. Now he, when Noxus invades Ionia, Sed grows deeply angry and impatient and decides to go and fight in the war. And in order to do that, he takes some forbidden ninja magic with him. And as he fights in the war using his forbidden shadow magic to fight the Noxians, he gathers to himself a lot of acolytes of his own. And so he returns to the Kinku Monastery and demands essentially to have dominion over the kinku to have to have access to all the sh the the shadow techniques of the kinku order and to become the new master of the order that his order of shadows must replace the kinku he kills the master of the kinku order a man named kushu and drives the surviving kinku out they are led now by shen who is the eye of twilight and the master of the kinku order who is trying to rebuild them in another monastery some distance away Akali, understandably, is not super happy about this, partly because one of her parents gets murdered in the bloody coup. Uh, and that's, you know, not, not a thing you get over super easily. So Akali really, it's like, I'm trained as an assassin. I'm literally the best assassin that you have at all. Shouldn't I, like, be killing the dudes before they start to destroy our entire order and jeopardize the balance? And, Sh and Shen's response to that is no. No, you should not, because Shen has struck an uneasy peace with Sed. In the aftermath of the Noxian invasion, as when Noxus was beaten back and now only controls a very small portion in the southern region of Ionia, Shen and Sed reached an uneasy peace accord. And Shen does not want to upset that balance, which Akali is not happy about. Akali wants to protect the people of Ionia from the predations of the Noxian invaders. Akali wants to take revenge on the Order of Shadows for the murder of so many members of the Kinku for upsetting the balance for destroying the peace, and Shen will not let her. And so, eventually, after several years of being the Fist of Shadow, Akali has had enough. She denounces Shen, she denounces his teachings, she denounces the Kinku Order. It doesn't work, it is rigid and ridiculous it doesn't allow people to help each other we can't work with this i'm bloody well leaving and so she does and becomes instead of the fist of shadow a rogue assassin traveling across ionia killing noxians where she can trying to fight uh, the order of shadows where she can seeking revenge whenever possible and trying to protect the people of ionia her own way 
Shen, for his part, lets her go. He doesn't try to stop her because he understands that this is a path that Akali must walk alone. And also because Shen is beginning to realize that it is his job to take the Kinku Order into a new era. Like to find some new way for the Kinku Order to persist without necessarily holding completely tightly to old traditions. That's part of Shen's lore update and Shen's story that maybe we're going to be tackling someplace down the line if he gets some more story to him. So, how does all of this tie back into Ionia? Well, if you watched the new Soul of Ionia video I did, I talked extensively about how the concept of Ionia, like the, the organizing principle around which all of the lore of Ionia seems to be, seems to be uh, orbiting, is this concept of tradition versus change. Where you have a bunch of characters who embody kind of the traditional values of Ionia, the traditional pacifism, the traditional harmony with nature, the traditional drive towards peace at whatever cost, and then you have a bunch of people who represent a change. And Ionia was forced into this conflict by Noxus. When Noxus invaded, they shattered the peace of Ionia, a peace that had been lasted, lasting for thousands of years, um, where people had been living in harmony with nature. They'd never really in, it's, it had much incentive towards violent conflict. They'd always tried to sort of keep the peace, live in harmony with nature, never taking too much, never, give, ne never you know, uh, giving, giving back whatever they took and so on. Noxus invades, and Ionia is faced with a choice. They can either hold fast to their non-violent traditions and just let the Noxians invade and fuck up all of the things and kill all of the people, or they can fight back. And a lot of characters decide to fight back. Sed is one of them, Irelia is another one of them, and Akali now has joined them as well. As well, weirdly, as Karma, who has also decided to take a more active role in fighting back the Noxians um, as part of her own little lore update, which again, we talk about in the Soul of Ionia video. So, so far so good. Uh, Akali fits very neatly into this uh, conflict between tradition and change. And notice that I don't say progress, tradition versus progress, because that's not really what's at stake here. What's at stake here is traditional values and, and you know, and, tradi and traditional identity and a traditional idea of what Ionia is versus something else. We don't know if it's better. We don't know if it's worse. Like, because one of the arguments that seems to be kind of simmering under the surface of these stories is if you just start fighting the Noxians with exactly the same violence that they're bringing to you, don't you run the risk of becoming the same kind of militarized, imperialistic nation? That's something that, um, when Syndra gets her lore update, we might be able to talk more about that. Because, um, there's a story in there that might have something to do with it. Unfortunately, I don't know how much it's being changed before it's getting published. But, yeah, it's, it's, maybe, possibly, we, we're going to get to talk a little bit more about, you know, becoming what you hate as an aspect of Ionian lore, which might be something that can interact with Akali's stories in the future. So, Akali has gotten herself a short story as well, to go along with, um, with the update. And since it's a five-minute read, I figure we can just kind of read it together and I can do one of my... Something I haven't done in a long time, like my little sort of nitpicky going through the writing of the story and talking a little bit about the principles of writing at play here. Because uh, it's been a while and we've got some extra time in this video since we're not talking so deep about the character design, so let's just do it. It's called Leading Wele, or Wele, or Huele, or however the hell you're supposed to pronounce things in Ionian. I really wish they'd had pronunciation guides alongside like a little icon you can click on and then someone would pronounce it correctly for you. That would kind of be nice. Anyway. Ah, hey, bully, I cry out. Cut me a little deep, don't you think? I crane my head up and around from the wicker mat I'm lying prone on to stare right into the eyes of the Vestaya kneeling over me. I can feel the blood sliding down my back. How about you be a little more careful, I add. Bo Lee pulls his qualo and mule, good lord, away from my shoulder. The tools of a tattoo artist, like a hammer and chisel made from serpent bone. Some use other animals or metal, but the serpent bones are just hollow enough to give the ink a f the fine line that a master like Bo Lee demands in his work. A little more of my blood drips off the mulean onto my back. He smiles, dabs it with a swatch of old linen, and shakes his head. Then he holds up his hands and shrugs, as if to ask, You want me to stop? The words don't come. The Noxian soldiers took most of his tongue before I began coming here, but I know him well enough to know what a look can say. His work is more than fair trade for a little discomfort. And the blood? I can take a little blood. A lot, if it's not my own. Just clean it up a little, okay? I don't think we have much time, I tell him. 
Boli begins tapping the moule and the qualo and adding the ink. He has the best inks. Rich colors made from crushed rikon, wild berries, and the enchanted flower petals found only on the southern faces of the Vlanco cliffs. He is a master, and I am honored to be his canvas. And this is where I have to stop and start with the nitpicking. Something I've talked about before when it comes to lore writing is that I think you need to be kind of careful about how many words you're asking the reader to add to their vocabulary in order to read a single five-minute short story about one character in your game. To wit, in the course of what we read so far, we've been introduced to the Qualo, the Mule, we've been introduced to Rikon Wildberries, and enchanted flower petals found only in the southern faces of the Vlonko Cliffs. What are all of these things? I do not know. Well, I do know. The Qualo and the Mule are traditional tattoo tools. Now, I don't know if they this is what they're called in real life as well. I doubt it. But when you do tattooing, what you need is a needle that can apply the pigment to the skin and keep it in there so that you actually get a tattoo out of it. And one of the ways that that used to be done was you had needles made from whatever the heck you had at hand and then a little hammer, and then you would kind of hammer the ink into the skin. So far, so good. What the writer is doing here is attempting to world build by telling us that he has a giant dictionary full of special words from this special magical world. And he's done a lot of world building. He's done a lot of thinking about all the special words that exist within this world. And he would like to tell you about all of his special words for the special things. But here's the thing. These aren't special things. These, these are the tools of a tattoo artist, like a hammer and chisel, right? So in an attempt to world build, He's asking us to keep in mind that this is what tattoo tools are called in this specific region of Ionia. But the trouble is, that doesn't come up again. They're not relevant to the story. They have nothing to do with what's actually going to be happening in the action. They have nothing to do with Akali's character. They do nothing to build her character. And that's kind of the issue that I'm going to be having in general with Leaving Wele is that... The story is supposed to be about Akali. It's supposed to be telling us something about her as a character, but the writer can't help but try and world build for all of Ionia in the process. And for my money, this is not where that's supposed to be happening. And it's something that I've, I've criticized Riot for before, is that when they have the opportunity to do these short stories, when they have the opportunity to tell us about the characters, to let us know something about their personalities, to build a little bit upon who, why they are the way they are, they kind of tend to squander those opportunities in favor of instead relentlessly trying to world build on Rune Terra itself. And I don't like, I understand why that is, because there isn't a lot of lore. Like, that has always been the problem for League of Legends, is that the writers just don't have a lot of opportunities to world build. They don't have a lot of opportunities to establish the universe that they want us all to inhabit, and so they tend to cram it in places where it doesn't belong, like, for instance, short stories that are supposed to inform us about the characters. And why am I focusing so hard on a couple of tattoo tools? Well, because over the course of this story, we're told the special names of the tattoo tools. We're told they're made from serpent bones. We're told that some use them from animal and metal, but serpent bones are just the right kind of hollowness to give the ink the fine line that a master like Boli demands in his work. But do you know what we're never told over the course of this story that begins with a scene where Akali is getting her tattoos? anything about the tattoos. We, we, we are not told anything about the tattoos, and that's kind of... But the tattoos are like... Look at Akali's new character design. The tattoos are an incredibly prominent part of who she is as a character. Like, it's a huge upgrade. Like, she used to have this tiny little snake tattoo on, the, on her back in her old model. That has been upgraded into this massive snaking dragon thing with all these designs and stuff that's going on. That's clearly some kind of symbology. There's clearly some kind of imagery there that's important to who Akali is as a character. And so, if you have a short story where she's getting that tattoo, like, that's what's happening at the start here, is she's getting that tattoo... Maybe you should talk about the tattoo. Like, this thing that she's putting on her own skin, clearly for some kind of reason, because she's been coming there for, like, a long time in order to get this massive thing done. That takes a long time when you don't have an electric tattooing tool. Shouldn't... What's the symbol... Why does she have a dragon on her back? Why did she want it? What does it say about her? What kind of... What does it communicate about her personality? What's she trying to remember by having this thing put on her skin? Is it just to intimidate her enemies? Does it mean something? Is it an emblem of protection? What is it? We don't know. 
but we do know what the tools are called that the tattoo artist is using to make the tattoo that we don't know anything about. This to me is, is a massive misplacement of priorities when it comes to world building. It would do so much more for me to learn something about what it means for an Ionian to have a dragon tattooed on them in terms of building the, the culture, in terms of building who they are as a people. Knowing how Akali relates to the dragon tattoo on her back would tell me a lot more about that than knowing that the tattoo tool is made from serpent bone and it's called a qualo and a mule. There was a little nitpick for you, an extended little nitpick. And just from a writing perspective, the more new terms, the more new special words you're asking the reader to remember, the more of their cognitive load you're adding. Like, you're adding cognitive load on the reader to keep all these words in their head and remember them so that if they come up again, they can remember them and understand what they mean. Which is even worse when they don't come up again. Like, this here... This section right there is the only time when the names of either of those tools come up and are important at all. They don't come up again in the story. They have no relevance to the story. The story doesn't use them as some kind of a symbol or some kind of, of imagery. So they've been added, you've, we've been asked to remember these words for no good reason. And that, for me, that's not great writing. Like, it's, it's, it's an, a writer who's trying to tell us how big the special magic dictionary for the world is. And this is not the place for it. Like, if this was a novel, if this was a novel-length thing, then this would be perfectly fine, because we would have plenty of time in the story, like, to explore, like, oh, some of the other tool names and how the tools... Like, like George R. R. Martin does this all the freaking time. But this is not a novel. This is a five-minute short story. Anyway, let's get back to the actual story. Bully begins tapping the mule with a qualo. Just say the tattoo tool, or the needle... Adding the ink. He has the best inks. Rich colors made from crushed rikon wild berries and the enchanted flower petals found only on the southern faces of the Vlonko Cliffs. He's a master, and I am honored to be his canvas. I started coming to Wele not long after I stopped listening to Shen. All those years in the Kinku Order. Treading carefully? No. Shen was wrong about that. About me. Restraint has never been my thing. I turn back around on the mat and rest my chin on top of my hands, keeping my eyes trained on the door that leads into Bolin's Tavern. Boli's Tavern, rather. Oboli? Booli? I don't know how to pronounce that thing. His place is clean, but the air hangs heavy with guilt. The tavern is home to a collection of thieves, rogues, and bad decisions. People come to Boli's to arrange a way out of Wele, out of Ionia. And by the way, names like Boli and Wele, with that little thing in the middle there, that too adds to the cognitive load of someone who doesn't, whose native language doesn't involve speaking words and names that have that thing in them. Like, we have, I, I keep having to stop and kind of, how the hell are you supposed to pronounce that? Is it Wele or Wele or Wele or Wheelie? Again, from a writing perspective, if you must introduce a bunch of foreign names, there's a reason why a lot of fantasy has magical names that sound kind of close to ordinary English names, because it's it, it lessens the cognitive load, makes the names easier to remember. It makes it easier to remember that Wele is not the person and Boli is not the region. Anyway, people come to Bolis to arrange a way out of Wele, out of Ionia, because getting into Wele is hard, but getting out is even harder. Wele is a phantom port, a hidden coastal village protected by the mystical properties of Ionia. Unlike Phalor, she doesn't welcome outsiders, and you won't find her on the maps. Should Wele appear at all, it's always on her own terms, daring people into doing very dumb things. Most approach from the sea, dreaming of riches, discovery, or maybe just a new start, only to have their hopes dashed in an instant. First, the shoreline that once called to them vanishes behind a dense wall of cobalt fog crackling with arcane power. The sea rises and falls violently before unleashing torrents of crushing waves. As the survivors cling to the splintered vessel, the fog pulls back for the briefest of moments, allowing them one look at the flickering lanterns of Wele, cruelly saying goodbye just before the water pulls them to the bottom of the breathless bay. <sighs> once again, none of this matters to the story at hand, because the story at hand, as we are going to see in a minute, is about Akali killing an Ionian who's been collaborating with Noxians. Like, that's, that's, that's the characterization of her, is that she's someone who will kill people who collaborate with Noxus because she's a punisher. She's someone, she's a, she's a vigilante, she kills people who hurt Ionia, that's her thing. But again, the writer is taking time 
to world build for Wele, to world build for Aeonia, to world build for Faelor, and to just this this baffled me when I read it the first time because it's like this is this extended paragraph describing the magical properties of the city that we're in, which we never get to explore. Like, there's no exploration of the town. There's no exploration of how the residents of the town relate to being a hidden city or to the magic that surrounds them or whatever. None of that. It's just this long, dramatic description of people being shipwrecked as they try to enter the city, but Akali never interacts with any victims of shipwreck. She doesn't She doesn't go to the sea to kill Noxians who are craw crawling up on the shore, or there's none of that. So, again, it's this weird digression that doesn't go anywhere and doesn't really do anything except attempt to world build for Rune Terra. So, I can't do anything about those people. Not my people. Not my problem. Boli stops tapping. I'm here for someone else entirely. I feel my satchel against my thigh. It puts me at ease, although I would rather have it on me. From there, I could fire three kunai into three hearts on instinct. Three kills without a thought. Where it is now, I'd have to think a little. Here we get, finally, a little bit of character building for Akali, is that she has a fixation on her satchel. She, she wants to be close to her tools. They give her some kind of comfort. I look up just in time to see the man come through the front door. He's flanked by three guards in their battle dress. Well, that makes it easy. I wonder which one I'm supposed to kill, I mock. Boli laughs. He can still do that, even without a tongue. It sounds a little weird, but it's real. He shakes his head again and does that thing he always does. With a series of hand movements and head nods, he tells me to try and do my business outside this time, after they leave his establishment. You know, I can't promise that, I say, as I check my satchel and turn towards the din of the tavern. And again, checking the satchel once more, that that's a good way to reinforce that that thing has some importance to her. That is kind of good character building. I pause at the doorway and turn back to him. I'll do what I can, I say, before lifting the mask over my face. I don't mind them seeing me, but if they saw me laughing at them, I think it would be just too much. The guy with the guards is my people. A high councilman from Puboe, a place not far from the Kinku Order. But, like many, he sold out his people to the invaders for gold and safe passage to Wele and beyond. So now he is my problem. But this is as far as he will get. Sure, I could have taken him out in his sleep at the inn or when they made camp along the road to Wele, but where's the fun in that? I want him to taste the salt air. I want him to feel a sense of relief before the end comes. But I also want the others to see him pay for his crimes and know that this will not stand. Actions have consequences. I approach without a sound. His hands are shaking as he raises a mug of ale to his lips. His guards stand in his defense when they notice me. I'm impressed. Nice to see manners around here for a change, I say, with a smile they cannot see. What's your business, girl? One of them asks through a plate of pitted and tarnished steel. Him, I say, pointing with my kama. It glistens with hues of the magic it was forged in. He's my business right now. The guards draw their weapons, but even before they can step towards me, they disappear in a thick ring of blinding smoke. The kunai begin to fly, hitting their targets with a satisfying flesh and bone thunk. One, two, three. Footsteps. I send two more kunai in that direction. A clang of metal followed by the thuck thuck of them ricocheting into the walls. More footsteps. Aw, oh, you're gonna bleed, I call out, flinging a single shuriken from my hip and flipping across the room, following in its wake. I break through the smoke and see the last guard splayed out on the ground next to the door. The three prongs lodged deep in his windpipe. I can see his chest rising and falling ever so slightly. I grab him by the collar, raise him up just to be sure. Almost, I whisper. At that moment, I hear a gurgling behind me. I turn to see the councilman through the receding smoke, bleeding out on the floor. His eyes are open, darting back and forth across the tavern, wondering what just happened. He looks so peaceful now. And that's the end of the story. So the latter half of it, finally we get to understand something about who Akali is, what kind of things she does for, you know, her living, or just for her daily activities, like what's her mission, what does she spend her time doing? Well, killing traitors is one of her activities, and she's relentlessly, apparently, efficient at it. Now, when it comes to um, writing fight scenes, some of the best advice I've ever gotten is instead of focusing solely on the action of the characters in the fight, focus on the feeling of the characters in the fight. Focus on the like the blood rushing through their ears or the the, the tactile sensations of things that are that are hitting where they're supposed to be hitting, or you're dodging and you could feel a, a sword throwing over you. And that's something that they do here. The kunai begin to fly, hitting their targets with a satisfying flesh and bone thunk. I really like that. Thuk, thuk. Like using those onomatopoeia to kind of heighten the, the, the drama and use and force the reader to imagine the sound for themselves in their head. That's I like that. That's that's actually that's actually really quite good. 
So, so much for Akali's bio. Insofar as it's meant to reflect the same kind of character as here, yeah, it works. Like, something we talked about when we talked about Akali's design previously is that she kind of looks like she's, uh, when, when I talked about her character design, what I talked about in terms of her tattoo was that when it comes to depictions of Asia in pop culture, and certainly when it comes to depictions of tattoos in Asian pop culture, tattoos are very heavily associated with crime syndicates. Especially in Japan, they're associated with the Yakuza. That is, assassins, thugs, drug runners, you know, gun dealers, thieves, all kinds of, of organized crime. And that kind of suits nicely with the Akali that we're seeing here, because this Akali is not some refined assassin striking her target in the night in silence, leaving no trace of herself behind. She kills this guy in a crowded tavern. She kills three guards and one dude in a crowded tavern in a bloody, very obvious brawl where everyone can see them because it's not about just the kill. It's also about sending a message. And that... Making an example of someone in broad daylight, that's the kind of methodology that organized crime might use to intimidate people into doing what they want. So in terms of reflecting that aspect of her character design, I think it works quite well. And as we talked about in, in the previous video about Akali's character designs, yes, I, I really do think that the sort of little bit more street fashion-y style that she's got going on here, and the much sort of leaner and, and, uh, and more agility focused and and sort of more practical style that she's got going on especially with her pants and stuff that really fits in very well with the idea that she's not so much the refined sort of highborn ninja assassin from the sacred order of the kinku as much as she's someone who waits for you in a dark alley and then slits your throat before you can say a word like she is a lot more brutal she's a lot more sort of down to earth than her kinku brethren and she's a lot more dangerous, and she's a lot more lethal, and she's a lot more merciless. All of that, honestly, the lore as it's presented right now, it works very well with her character design. Like, I really... She's very anime. Let's be clear about that. There's a hell of a lot of anime in Akali's character design, but I think it works for it. Like, it, I think it does sell the idea of this... Because one of the things about Akali is that she's young, right? She's, I think she's supposed to be 19 or 20 in the current state of the lore. She is young, and so it makes sense that in terms of her visual aesthetics and in terms of her story aesthetics, she reflects much closer to sort of something that's more relevant to our modern pop culture, like that she's closer to Naruto than she is to like ancient tales of the sacred ninja monks. I don't know if that's a thing, I just made, it's probably a thing, honestly. That she has this kind of a much, much less mystical bent and much more something towards modern pop, pop culture, something more gritty, in a sense. Not realistic, let's never call it realistic, because that's not a virtue, first of all, and it's not really what's going on either. But that she is a little bit more urban, in in a sense. Like, she's more, like, she looks more like she's from a city than a, from a, a hilltop monastery. And that works for her. And it works in the context of the story, where she's, you know, lurking in the back of a tavern, getting a tattoo from a dude who has had his tongue cut out, and then she murders four people because she doesn't like one of them. <laughs> it's like, yeah, honestly, all of this, I think it works quite well, which gets us to her quotes. I'm, I'm a little mixed on her new voice lines. Like, I, they're, like, it's better than what, like, this is literally all of her voice lines in the original, before the rework. That's there. <laughs> That's all of it. It's like, none. And she has a hell of a lot more in her new version, and a hell of a lot of chants and stuff, but... It's like, in terms of, I think she should have a lot more for characters like Sed. I think she should have a lot more for characters like Irelia, like Karma. She should have a lot more for Sed, uh, or rather for Shen, is what I mean. She should have some for Jin as well. She should have a lot more that are focused on her general conflict within Ionia. And the thing that's going on is that she's got like a bunch like from just like all over the place. She's got, she's got, uh, you know, attack quotes and taunt stuff, and it's like, her voice lines feel a little shallow. Like, they, it feels like there's a lot less here than Riot have been otherwise putting into new champions and rework champions recently. Like, Aatrox got, like, a fucking novel's worth of just voice lines, voice lines, voice lines, voice lines, voice lines, and then Nakali doesn't really get that much. Like, none of it conflicts with her story and her characters. Like, none of it doesn't, doesn't work. It's just... There isn't a lot of it, and I would like to see more aggression in the delivery. Sometimes the, the, the delivery is a little bit too quiet, I think, but that's, you know, a nitpick, honestly. 
Uh, yeah, that was just some reference for myself to keep around. And some... I don't know why those taps were in my thing. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it, I was done, actually. Okay, in my head, I thought I had more tabs and more things to talk about, but apparently, not so much. So, thank you very much for watching <laughs> so far. And thank you for, you know, supporting me on Patreon and, 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 and being around. Uh, if you remember from my last video a couple of days, I, I, I lost a pet recently to cancer. It still sucks. Not over it, but... That that just takes time, and work helps a little bit, so back to making videos, I hope. Plenty. If you like this video, you can hit the like button, that's actually very helpful. It, you know, makes the YouTube algorithm not ignore me, which, which is nice. At least I hope it does. No one fucking knows, but it's worth a shot. You can also subscribe, that also helps, and click the bell icon in order to actually subscribe and not just pretend like you're subscribing. And yeah, uh, I, yeah, as you already know, I have a Patreon. If you want to support it uh, with like a dollar, if you've got a dollar that you don't need, that you don't mind me having, I would be very grateful for it because it's like not much of my income comes from this at this point. So, oh boy, I hope it doesn't go away. <laughs> um, if you don't want to do that, that's of course completely 110% okay. I'm just happy that you've watched the video. If you didn't like the video, fair enough. That's fine. Uh, you can you, you can hit the dislike button. That is that's completely okay. And I promise you that the dislike button doesn't have any kind of I don't know spring-loaded trap that might launch four poison shurikens right at your head from behind you. That's that's not a thing. That's not a thing that happens. The dislike button is safe. It's perfectly fine to hit the dislike button. I will not take it as an offense against my royal person or a betrayal of the noble realm of Targon, of which I am the undisputed lord. I will not contract any angry assassins and send them your way. I definitely promise you that. Thank you very much for watching.